Coming up on this episode, if you've ever adopted a retired racing greyhound, there's a good chance you have her book on your bookshelf. Lead Living Good, author of Retired Racing Greyhounds for Dummies, joins us next on Greyhound Nation. This is Greyhound Nation, episode 32, recorded October 18th, 2022. Lee Livingood, author of Retired Racing Greyhounds for Dummies. Greyhound Nation is a podcast for Greyhound enthusiasts produced by Greyhound enthusiasts. To learn more about our show and its hosts, visit our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Greyhound Nation podcast. I'm Michael Burns. Now, here's your host, John Parker. Welcome back, Greyhound lovers. Our guest today is a longtime Greyhound friend of mine, Lee Livingood, dog behavior specialist and author. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm glad, I'm glad you uh, introduced me so nicely. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed by me. <laughs> so anyway. Let's go back a little bit and tell us a little bit about your, give us a little bio information, where you grew up and uh, how you got in, interested in dogs and dog behavior, and then particularly how you got interested in greyhound behavior. Well, that goes back a long way, but uh, I've had a kind of love affair with dogs since I was a little girl. I wanted to be a veterinarian, but that was back in the days when girls couldn't do that. Uh, so, you know, I just settled for always having dogs. There was literally a dog in the house when I came home from the hospital. Um, I used to drag in strays and hide them in the coal cellar, thinking my mother didn't know they were there. And then I became a parent and realized she did. Uh, so from there, I kind of just basically stayed with, I had various pets along the way. Um, when I was in college, you know, I, I went to Franklin and Marshall, um, and, which is a small liberal arts college in Lancaster. And while I was there, I adopted a dog from the shelter, it was a, a, a collie, shepherd kind of mix. And the dog had the worst separation anxiety I would ever, I never even heard of separation anxiety before that. And so um, in the process of trying to find help for her, uh, I started becoming more interested in behavior and, uh, as it turned out, this this poor dog absolutely needed to be with someone. So uh, I was lucky enough that a, a friend from uh, church found, had a farm and was a stay-at-home mom and had six kids. And so the dog literally did go to a farm. Uh, so <laughs> that was where I became interested. Then after I finished college, um, I was working for several years as a um, – as a lobbyist and a, a community organizer. And after I developed an in, I had an injury and developed some autoimmune diseases and had to really stop. You can't really walk on cobblestone in high heels for 14 hours a day. And so I had to make some adjustments. And since, since I had always been interested in behavior, that's when I began to study seriously. Uh, I did some intern, an internship with a woman who lives about an hour and a half away. Uh, for a year, and um, and then you know, study for my exam to pass the, my certification with the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Um, so that's kind of how I got from there to here. Then the Greyhound, um, back in 91, I first heard about retired Greyhounds. And uh, my husband and I both decided that sounded like a neat thing. We you know, seemed like great dogs. And we started investigating, but we had two small animals, a cat and a small dog, and no fence. And basically no one would talk to me. So uh, we kind of let that go for a while. And then one Sunday, there was an article in the newspaper locally uh, from a woman who ran the Greyhound, the Greyhound group locally. And um, I picked up the phone and called her. We went there the next Saturday. She had two dogs that had literally just come in like an hour before from Florida. They were the calmest dogs I'd ever seen in my life. And within three weeks, we had our first greyhound. Um, her name was Penny. And uh, she was she had just turned two about two weeks before we got her. So that was the first one. 
at the, as of right now, we're on numbers nine and 10. Um, we've also had a gal go in there at one point. And the book came about because one of the things that happened when um, we brought Penny home, we had a blizzard move in. And so there was ice and snow everywhere. And the first morning I took her out, we didn't have a fence yard. First morning I took her out in the leash, she saw a rabbit and took off. And I ended up on my butt in the middle of the deck. And it's like, <laughs> nobody told me that part. You know, I've been, I've been working with dogs and living with dogs my whole life. And that was my first experience <laughs> with a dog that could lunge like that and, and put me on the ground. So uh, that's how I ended up deciding to write the book. You know, I felt there were all these wonderful books out there and I'd read everything I could find on greyhounds, but none of them really talked much about behavior. They talked about what it was like the track kennels. Uh, or they talked about history, all of those things, but they didn't really talk about behavior, dog behavior as it relates to specifically the greyhound. So that's how my first book came about, which you know, I was told there was no market, so I published it myself. It was called Running with the Big Dogs. And then uh, I later was introduced by uh, to, to a, an editor at um, what was then Howell Bookhouse, and she, she wanted to see my manuscript for another book. And uh, from there, that's how the book came about. Um, so that's kind of how all the transitioning came. And the book ended up to be wildly successful. It's still being sold uh, 22 years later. And, uh, and so that's kind of the summary, uh, you know, summary of how it got to here. Uh, I've been doing professional behavior work with dogs and, and earlier with cats for 26 years. And um, I'm still doing some. I basically retired from my private consulting, but I'm still doing classes um, with dogs that are reactive on leash, you know, the ones that you see on the street that go rrr, 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 right, everything they see. Um, so I'm still doing classes to work with, with those kinds of dogs and an occasional private consult with if it's a former client or a former student or something like that. So I'm kind of like semi-retired, except some days like today, it didn't feel like I was semi-retired at all. So <laughs> as anybody who's retired probably knows. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's kind of so. As you got your um, as you got your education and you begin to develop your own techniques and so forth, are there are there different schools of thought in the dog behavior profession? Yeah, and they change weekly. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, back when I first started, the the whole dominance alpha master dog kind of thing was still kind of popular. But about that same time, uh, a man named Ian Dunbar who just changed the way people looked at for, at pet dog training. Uh, people refer to him and say he's the one who took the hurt out of dog training. Um, it started changing the whole thing to more positive kinds of methods and, and and from there people finally figured out, you know, we don't have to we don't have to use chalk collars. We don't have to use choke collars or prong collars or shock collars to get good behavior. And that fit right in with the way I kind of viewed the world and the way that it, when I was um, interning, the woman that I worked with was very much in that in that uh, in that uh, you know basket of of thinking. Uh, there's still some of the old you know hardcore kind of people still teaching, but most of us have moved to a more positive approach to doing it. Um, one of the things I did do as a result of, of well, the book and my first greyhound was uh, and seeing how different greyhounds are when they come off the track versus, you know, the average Labrador retriever that comes into a class at three months old. Um, they needed their own special way of learning because they had not had a reason to learn to sit or down or any of those other things uh, as part of their life on the track. So I began teaching greyhound only classes. I am the first one in the country to ever do that. Um, I also developed a way, one of the things that Greyhounds have a tough time doing sometimes is learning to sit. And I developed a technique for teaching that, which was amazing that no one thought of it before, but they hadn't. And it's basically I teach them down and then I teach them to sit from the down. Gee whiz, how hard is that? Um, and so, <laughs> you know, so I've still been, I guess I did my, I did my last Greyhound class at the beginning of this year. And given how low the numbers are in terms of adoptions, that could end up being the last one I teach unless something changes 
in terms of the number of dogs that are coming into into the area here. So, which would be really sad. So. Well, well, we'll get to this later, but we're sending lots of Irish greyhounds into Philadelphia and uh, Pittsburgh right now. Mm -hmm. So oh, you cool. may you may yet see a few Irish greyhounds, and it would be interesting to have you back and tell us if you see any differences in terms of their you know, temperament, trainability, et cetera. I have had, uh, over the years, many, several years ago, I had someone in one of my classes that had adopted an Irish Greyhound. And in the last Greyhound class that I taught, I had someone who had a, a dog that they had adopted from Ireland, or not from Ireland, but came from Ireland to a local group. Um, so, but that's one group and they're about two and a half hours away. They do some adoptions in the area. You know, Philadelphia is over two hours away. Pittsburgh is yeah. four or five hours away. So they're not really probably adopting out a whole lot in this area at this point. But as the more and yeah. more of the track dogs are gone, uh, I expect that we'll see more of the uh, Irish dogs. And I know that uh, the, the, the organization in State College is adopting out uh, Irish dogs. So. No, Did I, you I, notice any difference in them no. as uh, students? No. Uh, the one, the one girl that was in the class was a little shy, but she was no shyer than some other greyhound might be. And as she learned, she got used to the other dogs and, and used to be coming to the class, she turned into just basically the same old greyhound everybody has, you know, uh, you know, I tell everybody yeah. your first one's perfect and your second one's a real dog. Um, because people <laughs> do, they, they get hooked because the first one is always just a delight and then they get a dog that does things that, you know, they weren't, weren't really planning on. So. Well, you obviously at some point made a, a transition or at least a partial transition from uh, doing individual consultations and teaching classes and so forth to be, to being a speaker. That's where I first met yeah. you. If memory serves, it was at a GPA back, back in the day when Greyhound Pets of America had <clears throat> national conferences yeah. every year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, they had, you know, a, a litany of good speakers yeah. and you were one of them. Yeah. And, uh, tell us about how you became, when did you start getting invitations to be a speaker and what, what that challenges did one. you find for that versus teaching? Yeah. That was the first one. The first time when I met you was the first time I had ever spoken, uh, in a group like on, on, well, about dogs. I mean, in my previous careers and whatever, I was accustomed to speaking in front of groups. But doing a presentation at a conference like that related to dogs or great dogs was the first time I'd done that. In fact, that's where we met. And I think that was about 2000. It was around 2000. Yeah, that sounds about right. So maybe even 2002, but it wasn't any later than that. So, um, so you know, I've always been, for a long time, you know, let me put it this way. My high school yearbook uh, said something like, she always has an opinion. <laughs> so I guess that's where it came from. Uh, you know, I, I've had reasons in various careers uh, or, or modifications of various careers uh, to speak in front of groups or speak, you know, for, on a particular subject, like you know, in a situation like this, doing a, a podcast or something. Um, but, uh, the, you know, so it just kind of evolved. You know, when I was lobbying, I would often be speaking to like a, a group from the, um, I, I lobbied for the Pennsylvania, what was then the Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce, and I handled all their energy and environmental issues. So I would, you know, when we had board meetings, which were hundreds of people, I would be doing the presentation on whatever the topics were that were in the legislature at that point in time. And when I worked for the U.S. Senate, when the senator was not in Pennsylvania, then I would take his place at various functions and uh, speaking engagements. So it really kind of came naturally. It was just shifting gears to a different topic. So. Yeah, you certainly couldn't tell that you were, it was your first time speaking to a, a Greyhound group because that, and that's what I found uh, uh, interesting about it is that you didn't use many notes. You were, you knew what you shut your subject matter. Uh, you were engaging, you, you injected humor into it. And most of the thing that I love most of all, I think, it was just so common sense. You know, you, you definitely were speaking against what I call the fur baby mentality. <laughs> dogs need to be approached yeah. and respected as dogs yes. and they're not small children. And mm -hmm. uh, that really, you know, 
that resonated with me, I can tell you that. And don't get me started on costumes. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> costumes for both. Yeah, don't get me started on costumes. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah, you know, that was, um, and it wasn't just that I was so confident that I was working out with notes. I'm ADHD. If I try to follow a script, I'm in deep trouble. You know, like somebody would do a, do a nice slideshow for me. And I kept going off on tangents and made them just crazy. So I said, <laughs> okay, you know, I'm, I sort of say, okay, these are the things I want to cover. And I just open my mouth and keep going and hope, hope what comes out makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, uh, if I, if memory serves, you, you began doing for groups, yeah. our group, GPA Atlanta used you for an all day seminar, essentially. Yeah, we did a couple and, of them um, for you. I, you know, I came down a yeah, couple of times. Yeah, and, and that was great. I mean, it was for new adopters, established adopters, and um, it was just a great way to kind of have some expertise on the Greyhound psyche, so to speak. Uh, and it, it, did you did you do that for a number of years? Oh, yeah. For different and groups? I guess the last time was a few years ago when the, when the, the numbers, when the track started closing and the numbers of groups and the number of people involved kind of dwindled. But I'd done... I guess I've done seminars or workshops in probably 10 different states over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's most of them in the South, but some of them in the Southwest and California and, you know, Midwest. And so. Did, did you find that the, uh, the degree of the fur baby mentality was a regional thing at all? No. Is there more in one part of the country than the no. other? <laughs> They're equally crazy <laughs> everywhere, you know. <laughs> I, and, you know, and, and I do have to say, it's not just people who have greyhounds. The worst offenders right. are the ones that have toy breed dogs because they think they need to be carried <laughs> around. Uh, so they're worse. But, uh, but, yeah, you know, people who don't respect the animal for what it is for its own what it brings to the party, so to speak, uh, I find troublesome. Uh, you know, when people try to turn them into furry children instead of respecting them for what they are and who they are, um, I get in trouble for that one because I'm very clear about my distaste for it. In fact, <laughs> you may not remember this, but that one of the times I came to Atlanta and we went to, and I forget whose picnic it was or, or your event, and they decided I was going to judge the costume party. Or the costume contest, and it was like, no, <laughs> this is not. Good. And so I ended up judging who had the softest fur. But uh, I, don't, I just remember. Well, our we, group never did costumes, so it must be a another uh, yeah. another group in the yeah, Atlanta we, area. So we, yeah, I, I could I would have bought a ticket to, there, to be I, there when you were asked to judge the costume yes, contest. So, so nobody's made the mistake of doing that again, but. Um, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, because if they do, they get a lecture along with me saying no. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's been it's been an interesting ride, you know, to go from the kind of things that I had been doing previously, you know, community organization lobbying, uh, you know, working in government or I should say around uh, the legislature and whatever. Uh, this was quite a, well, quite a transition, um, but it was a transition that made sense in that I'd always looked at dogs and dog behavior and wanted to know more and learn more. And so I did what I did with most things, which is like, okay, how do I, how do I become, how do I develop some expertise? I don't want to say expert because they're a lot, you know, but how do I develop expertise in the area that I'm functioning in? And, uh, and that's what I tried to do with, um, with the career and with whatever. And I, I found it, I've loved it, but you know, there's a point at which, uh, you know, as the world changes, you know, we change with it and I'm not 20 anymore. So, and you know, when I was, yeah. when I was doing, when I was doing one-on-one -on -one consult, I was sometimes, I'm, I might have a client that's two hours away. So I do try two hours to get there, spend two hours with them and two hours back. And that's a whole day. Um, oh yeah. So, you know, yeah. because I had, you know, I'm in central Pennsylvania and I've had clients down near Philadelphia in Baltimore, uh, up near state college. Uh, up near Williamsport, um, you know, so, so basically I would basically, I, I do a consult for anybody that needed it. If they were willing to cover the travel time for me to get there and back. So, yeah, and, yeah. you know, so the, on the road part, I don't miss, um, 
and I don't miss all the paperwork that goes with it because you know there is a lot to do before the before the consult and as follow up afterwards, including you know, like reports to the vets and that kind of thing. But uh, but yeah, so I miss a bit. But what I'm doing now is is also challenging because the three active dog class that I'm working on, um, I basically off I basically agreed with a, to a, to help a friend with classes. So it was like I do one night a week. Uh, do a couple of classes so so she could fill up you know her roster, and then next thing you know she wanted me to do a reactive dog class, and I looked at it and decided well yeah but we need to work on this, so I basically started it and developed it from this crap from the ground up and I'm still working on making it better and and you know figuring out why this works and that doesn't or what if we try this what if we try that. That's one of the things that goes with ADHD that's great, is that you're always looking at new things to do. <laughs> it may make people around you a little crazy, but it, it, it's sort of good for your imagination, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. Now, in greyhounds, as you've, as you've treated various uh, problem dogs over the years, problem greyhounds over the years, what percentage of the time would you say the, the problem was inherent to the dog versus the the problem was really with the human it depends on on the if it's a separation anxiety issue that's often part of the dog's genetics part of their makeup separation anxiety uh some kinds of aggression um it tend to be somewhat heritable um so those things may or may they, those could be a combination i do find however that the more often a dog has been moved the more likely it is to have separation anxiety uh, you know, they, the finding that, you know, with them, if the first, you know, it takes them months before they get settled where they are. And if that keeps getting disrupted, they become, for lack of a better word, just over anxious to the point that they can't stand being alone. So there's some, there's some behavior, there's some behavior part of that, not just, it's not just nature. It's, um, you know, a combination of both. Some behaviors that seem to have some genetic links, uh, or I should say, might be inherit, might be heritable, are things like resource guarding. You know, the dog that guards a bone or the food dish or whatever. Sometimes that, if you if you know about the parents and the rest of the litter, you know that it's it's in, in the whole litter. On the other hand, there are also dogs that you know, greyhounds particularly, that nobody's ever tried to take a bone from them. It's not like they're laying you know laying around in the you know in the kennel with chew toys. Um, not that they don't get them, but it's nobody tries to take them. Uh, nobody tries to take their yeah. food bowl till it's empty. So if, <clears throat> if the dog comes into a home and people don't spend the time to teach them the things that make them a good member of the family, and that's really how I describe it when I talk to my classes, is that, you know, this is, it's, training is not something you do to your dog, it's something you do with your dog. Just like raising a child, it would be, only they aren't very kids that don't think that. Um, so, so anyway, uh, so sometimes, you know, if they don't take the time to teach them not to guard their resources, you know, that can be a problem. If they don't take time to teach them to move off the bed instead of growling at you when you wake them up, that kinds of be a problem. And that's not necessarily something inherited. It's just these are what dogs do if they've never been taught otherwise. So an awful lot of problems that I see could have been fixed if somebody did it right away instead of wait, waiting for it to become serious. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, those are the things that come off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are others that also fit into that pattern. Um, one of the things that's been difficult with people who are adopting any dog, greyhounds included, through the whole pandemic was the lack, the inability to properly socialize the dogs. You know, um, nobody was going out anywhere. And so the dogs yeah. weren't meeting other dogs in the street. They weren't going to meet and greet. They weren't doing those kinds of things that help them learn what their new world is all about. Um, and, you know, I saw the same thing with the whole pandemic puppies, two-year-old puppies in, in a class now that didn't meet another dog. And now they think that other dog is Cujo or whatever. So uh, that's, been a, that's been a problem, not just for greyhounds, but for all, any dog. And it's been a problem for young children. I was reading some stuff from somebody, uh, a young mother whose child was born just before everything closed down. The kid's never been in a grocery store. 
you know, until things opened up enough, it was safe, until vaccines were there and whatever, and it was safe to take children into these places. And the kids, they don't know what any of this is. So, you know, it ha the same thing happened with anybody, you know, dogs, kids, whatever, that only life they knew was during the, uh, during the COVID shutdown stuff. So anyway, but, but that's opening up and, um, you know, the classes I'm doing are not the same as doing consults, but they have their own kind of reward and their own kind of aggravations too. So. Yeah. What, uh, in Greyhounds over the years, what have you found to be the number one behavioral issue or challenge? Separation anxiety. Probably yeah. more than anything else. Occasionally, um, they don't like being disturbed on the bed and nobody taught them not to do that. Um, occasionally, there is some true aggression that, you know, the, it's just the way it is. Uh, it's not, it may be, uh, uh, it may be part of behavior, of, of how they how they were raised, what's happened to them in the past. I I find that when I see one of the greyhounds that tends to be reactive to other dogs, they've often had their one of their first experiences with a dog other than a greyhound when they came off the track was not a pleasant one, mm -hmm. and so they start yeah. deciding that dogs are kind of scary and and the best defense is a good offense. So let's just bark and run. Um, so those are things that come up. Um, Occasionally, house training issues, but that's usually in almost every case, unless the dog has a urinary tract infection, which is the first thing I make people do is take the dog to the vet to make sure that's not a case. That's almost always improper house training. It's not that the dog isn't house trained. It's that the person didn't take time to train them properly. So they didn't confine them when they needed to. They didn't take them out often enough and... and reward them in a way that let them know oh, when I go out here I get goodies when I go in the house you know nothing happens and you know that kind of thing so so those those are the kinds of things that I see coming off the track because the thing that the track did which is really positive in one way is that everything was very structured everything was going to happen the same time in the same way every day uh, and then they get into reality if they go into a home with a lot of structure and they fit into the structure, it kind of works itself out. But if the home isn't structured, sometimes those dogs just can't handle it. I've worked with a couple of dogs where literally the only thing that we do with them is send them back to the farm or to the greyhound group or whatever, because they couldn't handle not having that much structure. Um, uh, I can think of a couple of them over the years, maybe three or in 25 years, 26 years. Uh, but they do happen where they're just happier if they're in a, you know, in, in that environment that they knew and were comfortable in. Uh, otherwise, yeah. they just get too freaked out. So um, let's see, what else can I think about uh, that comes up as a routine? Um, usually, occasionally there'll be one that likes to really drag you around on leash, but most of them are pretty reasonable on leash. Um, stay can be a little difficult until you can get them to learn to do a down or a sit because when they're standing there, it's just too easy to say, oh, I think I'll move along. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the basic stuff, recalls actually are not as difficult as people think they may be. Um, I had one of my girls, um, I, I tell this story about all the, all the time because she was, her recall was so good that I could literally call her off a rabbit. She would be chasing a rabbit and all it took was Cheyenne come and she would turn around and come to me. Now, believe me, <laughs> she got whatever meat was in the fridge when she did it, but, <laughs> but you know, she would, she was that well-trained with recall. Now, not all of them can do that, but she was one right. that could. You know, I've had other dogs that do really, really well with good solid stays and other dogs where that's just too hard for them. So each of the dogs yeah, is like yeah. kids. They have their own set of abilities and their own set of things that they're not quite as good at. That doesn't change with, that doesn't seem to change with domestic species. You know, we, we see the same thing. You know, you've got a kid who's really good at art, but they're lousy at math. Well, you can have a greyhound that's really good with a recall and isn't so great with a stay. Um, you know, you have a greyhound that's really great with kids and loves every kid they see. And another one is like, oh my God, get it away from me. Um, you know, but then again, there are people like that too. Um, you know, so, yeah. I mean, my, I, I often joke that there's a reason I have four dogs and one kid 
Uh, you know, <laughs> I really understand dogs way better than I understand children. Uh, and I think I wonder my I think my son might even agree with me if he heard me say that. Uh, so anyway, he says he wants to come back as one of my dogs. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I, you mentioned uh, the pulling greyhound. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I seems like lately at greyhound events, I've seen a lot more greyhounds wearing harnesses than back in the day. What's your take on on harnesses for if for greyhounds? they're if they're the, if they're the right harness, I'm actually in favor of them. I recommend harnesses for every dog because what we found is that even a regular buckle collar can cause some damage to the trachea uh, over time or some damage to the neck just because of the pulling against it and that kind of thing. So I actually, it used to be that everybody, like if you have a toy breed, you should have them in a harness because of their neck and, and the damage that could be done to their trachea. But we're finding more and more that that's not just little toy dogs. That's also other dogs. So um, I actually am a big fan of them if it's the right harness. Some of these things look just plain silly, and some of them won't keep a dog from getting away from you. But if you use a harness and use it properly, um, you know, people talk about that harness, where, putting a dog in a harness will teach them so that they can pull. Well, it doesn't do that. Um, you know, what teaches them to pull is pulling. You know, if they, I don't know of a single dog anywhere at any time they ever taught that would walk nicely on the leash and pull if you put them in a harness. If you put them in the harness and they're already pulling, you can't blame the harness. So, um, and that's... Uh, doesn't that's the, the just, a, just a, a quick devil's advocate on that, doesn't the harness, though, make it more comfortable to pull? No, not necessarily. No? No, I mean... Because we, you put cart dogs in a harness, you don't have them pull right. with a collar on. For right, example. exactly. But that doesn't mean that putting any other breed in a harness will create the same thing. Um, okay. so for instance, plus if you know if the dog is wearing a collar, I've seen dogs virtually choke themselves pulling on a collar. Um, I'd rather they pulled on the harness and and gave me a chance to teach them to walk politely. Uh, rather than having them kind of dragging around at lint and lunging at the end of a collar, you know, especially greyhounds, if you think about those long necks and spines, and they've got a collar on and they lunge forward and kind of do that whip, you know, sort of whiplash thing with their head, that's not good for anybody. Um, so, you know, I've I've gotten to wear, you know, when I walk my guys, they wear harnesses. Um, but I took time to teach them not to pull me around, you know, drag me down the street before we went to that. And I did that, you know, the hardest thing that people understand is if you can't get the dog to walk politely inside, you've got no chance outside. And getting them to yeah. teach their dog to walk on a harness indoors and wait to have the leash put on politely, wait for the door to be open and be given permission to go out the door. You do all those things and you start solving your pulling problem because they've learned a new way of doing things. Um, I worked with dogs, I'm going back, and it, it was an Italian greyhound actually, that when I had the dog on a leash, he walked with me, well, he was lovely, he walked on, no problem. If his owner had them on a leash, he tried to drag her around. Now, it's all, you know, she was an older woman and it was a little dog, obviously. But if she took the leash off, he walked beautifully. The leash actually became a cue to pull. It didn't become a cue with me because he didn't live with me. Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't get away with pulling with me because we just didn't do that. But with her, the leash had become such a cue to pull that he walked beautifully if it was off, but he pulled her around if it was on. Um, and I've seen that with, I can think of another dog, um, the same issue. If you had them on a, a leash, they were always at the end of the leash. If you didn't have them on a leash, they were next to you. Do you have a particular style or brand of harness that you recommend for greyhound owners? Uh, the ones that I'm using right now are the uh, rough wear harnesses. Um, I forget which particular model, but they're nicely padded, and um, they have both a back loop and a front loop. So if you've got a dog that does have a little bit of a pulling problem, you can use the front, the front loop like you would with an easy walk harness or one of those. I like them because they're made in a way that the dog's not going to escape. Uh, a lot of the no pull harnesses, to me, I've seen too many dogs slip out of them. Whereas if a properly fitted harness like the Roughwear is not likely to to have that kind of problem. Um, 
I've seen some Greyhound people with some harnesses on that have all kinds of straps that go literally down to their belly. Um, supposedly they're escape free, but I don't know how comfortable they'd be uh, or how useful they'd be and how much fun it would be getting them on in a hurry. But um, so. Has the halty fallen out of fashion for Greyhounds? I've never used a halty. So the, the mechanism yeah. that goes so around the, the muzzle? The leader? Uh, I haven't seen a lot of it. I don't use them. I don't like them. My preferred, if I need to use, and you know, like for instance, I've got a dog in one class right now. It's an Irish wolfhound and it pulls. Well, you know, an easy walk harness or a regular collar or whatever is not going to help that, that person or that dog. Um, and I don't like the gentle leaders. I prefer one that's called the canine bridle. It actually, the only time it, you know, the, the, uh, the gentle leader has to be really snug around the neck and really snug around the muzzle to work properly. And it attaches in the front, which means if the dog pulls, you're kind of doing this with their head all the time. What I like about the canine bridle is that it fits, it attaches behind the dog's head and it only tightens if the dog's pulling. If the dog's not pulling, it's not tight. And it also has a safety strap on it that goes from the, from the harness to a collar. So should they slip the, har the collar, I mean, goes from the head collar to the to the collar. So if they slip the head collar, they're still attached to a, a collar and they're not escaping anywhere. So if I need to use them, and occasionally, I generally find that with dogs like Great Danes and Irish Wolfhounds and uh, Mastiff types where they're really, they're just too strong for a person who has the, who's on the other end. And often they're dogs that were adopted as um, rescues. So they already had developed a number of bad habits before they got to the person that's being dragged around uh, you know, and face planting every, every time, every time they go for a walk. So, so yeah, I like those, but I don't use them very often. I only use them when they're necessary. Otherwise I prefer to just work with either a plain harness or a plain buckle collar. Well, in the case of Greyhounds and Martingale, so they don't slip out of it Yeah. and, and getting people to understand not to let their dogs get behind them. Uh, is is really hard because that's when they get loose. So, uh, let's uh, transition over to your books. I'm I'm always fascinated uh, with greyhound authors in general and greyhound authors in particular mm -hmm. about how they, you know, formulated their first book, how they got it published. Uh, running with the big dogs, you mentioned it. It was not a particularly was it a Greyhound specific book? Yes, I have it. Yeah. And I just don't yeah, remember. It's uh, Running with the Big Dogs, The Gentle Art of Turning a Retired Racing Greyhound into Your Best Friend. Um, there we go. Yeah, it was okay. Greyhound specific. And I wrote it based on, as I said, my experience with the, um, with being pulled on my face and my butt in the, in the snow. <laughs> uh, but it's, so it grew, it, that one I kind of did. I didn't have an editor. I just kind of freelanced it and did it because I couldn't get anybody to agree at that point to read it. They kept insisting that there weren't enough, there wasn't a market for it. Um, and I was able to convince them that there was a market for it. And I was asked to submit it, uh, um, <clears throat> submit it to someone to look at. And they liked it enough to then ask me to write the, the what, what started off, it was going to be a complete idiot's guide. And then the company was sold. And then it was going to be a, a dummy's book. And so it's kind of gone through some transitions. So. So, Lee, the Running with the Big Dogs book was essentially self-published? Yes. Um, I felt there was a need for it, but I couldn't find a publisher who agreed with me at that point in time. Now, a couple of years later, they did, but at that point in time, it was I, I felt it really needed to be out there. So I basically self-published it and let people know it was available and um, sold it virtually for cost. I mean, because you can imagine when I'm only printing like 25 copies at a time, the, the printing costs were outrageous. So it basically, you know, I, I didn't really make any money on it to speak of, especially since I was also donating 10% of whatever I did make to one of the local Greyhound groups. So uh, it was not a money-making enterprise, but it was, it was, I really enjoyed doing it. And I was working on it at a time when I had the luxury to do that. I wasn't trying to juggle it around a full-time job um, or those kinds of things. So and it was kept it keeping me busy because I was dealing with some health crises with my husband, and it gave me something to do that to other than worry about that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. 
Now, did you did a publisher ultimately pick it up, or did you continue to self-publish? Uh, no, what happened was um, I changed the manuscript a little bit, added some things to it, and then I was at a, a dog trainer convention, Association of uh, Pet Dog Trainers con- Convention, and Ian Dunbar, who's published countless books on training and 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 basically advocating for more positive methods of training, introduced me to an editor and told him, told her about the book. And she asked me to submit a copy to her. And I did. And uh, about six, eight months later, I guess it was, I got a call asking me if I would do, well, it wasn't, at that point in time, it was Hal Bookhouse and they had complete idiots. So it ended up, how it ended up being a dummy's book is a whole adventure in and of itself. That's how it came about, is that, you know, after reading it, you know, when I sent it the first time, they basically just blew me off and said there's no market and didn't even read it. But the second time, since I was sending it directly to an editor, uh, it did get read and it was, they did decide it was uh, good to go. So, is um, Are you still selling some copies of Running With The no, Big Dogs? Uh-uh. In fact, I probably have to, well, first of all, I'd have to transfer, change it all from uh, whatever whatever format I had it in. I think it was Word Perfect, and then I you know, eventually turned it into Word. Um, so, and it's on some disk somewhere, you know, from back from when I was using a, a, a you know using a PC instead of uh, instead of Mac. So, so I could, I'm not even any sure. idea how many total you sold? Um, a few hundred, you know. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. three, four hundred, somewhere in that range, but not more than that. So, and yeah. still, so, okay, so that uh, the, con- the contacts you made through that, uh, through Ian Dunbar's discussing it, led you to a publisher that ultimately led to the um, retired racing greyhounds yes. for dummies, which I have <laughs> happened to have a copy of. I'll hold it up right there. Get it over there. There we go. <clears throat> Tell us about how how you came to write that and, and how you got started with, uh, you know, developing a book according to their format. Um, well, they send you the format. Um, you know, well, it started off and I actually did write it in the format for complete idiots guide. And after I, I was submitting it even before I had a signed contract, I will never do that again. After I sent it in, literally I signed my version of the contract, returned it, and two days later, the, the, the publisher was sold and that it was sold to the dummies people. So then it became a question, would they pick it up? And I was told they would, but it, I waited like, oh, I'm trying to remember maybe six months, maybe even a year before I heard from them saying, yeah, we want to go ahead with this. And they sent me the, um, you know, at that point I got a signed contract before I would do another thing. And, um, and they sent me the format that it needed to be in and, and we tinkered with it a bit. You know, they had very strict order about how many pages could be in each chapter. And, um, but some of the chapters didn't need that many pages and some of them needed way more. And at that point in time, they were pretty, they were pretty good about it. And then um, we got that done and it was a new editor and it turned into just probably one of the biggest nightmares of my life because when it was sold, you know, when it was in the other format, when I, the last talk discussion I'd had with my editor, the one that was working with me on the book, she told me other than taking out some stuff of the, about history of dog, you know, about former, the former way dog training was done using work, you know, harsher methods. She said, I took that up. Other than that, everything's fine. Just a couple of typos. That's it. And so then I wait to hear from these other folks and finally, we're going to make it a dummy's guide. And I kept saying, you know, I kept saying something doesn't sound right here. And she kept saying, oh, well, we consolidated some things. It's all still there. Because I'm looking at the table of contents. It's like, wait a minute, there's stuff missing. And apparently what happened is between the time I had the last contact and the new contact, a bunch of people had nothing to do while their company was being sold. So they tinkered. And when I got it back, I didn't recognize it. Uh, they, I'll bet that, you it, basically, that. what it was then was one of their typical generic dog books that had a greyhound on the cover and one or two chapters about greyhounds. I literally rewrote the entire book in 17 days. 
Literally. Oh, goodness. I did not. I slept. I didn't sleep more than two hours or three hours a night. And, but I got it because I had a deadline. You know, they wanted me to do the author's read through. And I, when I read it, it's like, oh, my God, I don't want my name on this thing. Uh, so I started over and I figured by getting it in at the very last minute, they didn't have time to screw with it. <laughs> so, <it's>, so. <laughs> I, I mean, I was going to ask you, did you have to raise hell to get, um, you know, what, what have you done to my book? You know, that sort of thing. I did, or, or I how did was, say, you know, ah, you know, what, what's wrong? This is, this is all wrong. And, you know, but I was working again with somebody still who had never seen it before. So, and they were out of Indianapolis instead of New York and just all of those kinds of things that, it, it could not have been a worse experience, but it got done. And, um, you know, the response to it had been excellent. Um, it's still selling, you know, 22 years later, uh, though, though I really wish I could have updated it along the way. Um, they did contact me about doing the revised version of it, but they wanted it to be a Greyhound book, not a retired racing, not a retired Greyhound book. And, Instead of, um, and they wanted to basically do it, wanted me to do it basically as a work for hire, as opposed to getting uh, my royalties that I've been getting for 20 something years. And it was sort of like, first of all, I, I explained to them that, you know, the market isn't really there like it was for this book. Um, but also, you know, I, I wasn't willing to take six months off work for the measly amount that they wanted to pay me. So it's like um, I kind of passed on it, and but they also I convinced them they should pass on it too because I knew what they were going to do to it if they went ahead with it. I probably shouldn't be saying that case <laughs> if somebody watches this, uh, but you know it really would not have been that book, and there really isn't with all the tracks. I explained to them. I said, you know, we've only got like three or four states that have tracks any longer. Uh, we don't have the number of dogs coming off tracks that we used to. And, um, you know, that it was at a time when we were, it was still kind of iffy what groups were going to do. You know, were they going to bring in Irish dogs? Were they going to take in sight hounds that weren't greyhounds? You know, all that stuff. So it really would not have been anywhere near worth my time to have done it for the, you know, for the kind of amount they wanted to pay me. Um, not for the, I mean, because I knew the whole book had to be rewritten. This wasn't just a quick, you know, updating. This was of so much had changed in 20 years that I needed to rewrite the book. And that's the only thing I would have been willing to put my name on. And I'm not sure they would have been willing to do it when it came down to that. So, yeah. So, yeah. But did you, um, uh, did, did running with the big dog serve as a template? Yes. Uh, for the kind of the seed, a text of, uh, of the dummies yeah. book. There, there was a lot I used and a lot that I didn't use. Um, you know, because even in the time from when I did the dummies book until I was writing the you know, idiots or dummies or whichever one it was at the time, I, even then, even then a lot had changed and I learned more. And so it was, it was similar in the sense that the chapter, the focus of the various chapters were basically the same. Um, but they were written in a different format, obviously. You know, I couldn't use the format I used. It would have been way too long. Oh, that was the other thing when they sent it back to me to do the final edit. And I saw all the stuff missing. They also told me I had to cut 80 pages. So it was like, <laughs> like I said, 17 days nonstop. And <laughs> to get it to not only fix it, but to also cut pages out at the same time, which was not an yeah. easy task. Yeah. How long had it taken you to write the first version that they chopped up? Uh, let's see. I, they contacted me, I'm going to say March, and I had to have, um, now keep in mind, there's a, a lag here of about a year before, you know, before the, we went back to it. But the, the arrangements had been, I'm thinking I had from March to June to have the first, you know, draft to them. Um and maybe it was maybe it was January to June. Maybe it was more like six months. Um, but then everything, you know, that's when the whole contract thing fell apart, and we just sat there for a while. When they got back to me, it was also uh, I had a June deadline for a September publication. So there really wasn't time when I returned it exactly on the last day I had to return it. 
uh, there really wasn't time for anybody to tinker with it too much before it went to press. So thankfully, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Do you have any notion of how many total copies have sold? Um, I haven't really looked. I mean, I know that kind of sounds odd, but uh, I haven't, I've never really looked at the total number of copies. Uh, I know that it's done really well over the years. Um, it's still doing okay. I mean, you know, it's been, it's, it is outdated and that bothers me, but I don't get to fix it on my own. So, um, yeah, yeah. but no, I've actually never bothered to look, I could look it up, but you know, I mean, all I have to do is go online and look, but I never really bothered to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, I was looking, I was paging through it. I've read the whole thing, of course, and I was paging through it to get ready for the, our conversation. And, um, I noticed that, um, uh, the quote on the front is from Bruce Skinner, who was the editor in chief of the the old website of Read Apart, and I haven't heard from him or of him in in a long time. Have you heard anything about what he's doing? Or I, I guess the website's no longer no, it's not there. Is it? um, it's not, uh, and I'm trying to remember. It's been quite some time that it's been gone. Uh, I'm going to say maybe you know, as much as fifteen years, maybe not quite yeah, that long, but yeah. it's been gone quite a long yeah. time uh, because I remember when it just kind of, you know, I, and I don't remember whether I found out from in communication with him or whether I found out some other way that it was being going to be closed down. So, so yeah. Yeah, so, but no, it's sad because he did an incredibly good job on that. It's just a wonderful job. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. It's be really mm -hmm. interesting to find yeah. out what, uh, you know, where, where he is, he's still uh, in the Greyhound world or what mm -hmm. he's doing now. You also had a number of uh, very nice quotes on the inside cover from Ian Dunbar and Joan Bell Isle and some other folks. Did you arrange those or is that something the publisher does? I've, I was asked to get them. You know, so basically it's my job to get people to say nice things. So, <laughs> uh, and then there had to be a technical edit, even though, you know, I, so um, I had to pass that along to one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the local Greyhound groups to do the technical edit. Um, so, you know, cause they got, you know, they get paid to do those technical edits. So that gave them a little bit of a, a, a donation, so to speak. So. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, was there an, was there a book launch? No. Uh, where they, you showed well, up at a bookstore or no, a Greyhound event or no, something not like that? for something like this. Uh, if I wanted to do anything like that, it would have come out of my pocket. And in a sense, the book <laughs> launch was Greyhounds reach the beach because the book came out in September. And the oh, first time okay. I spoke, um, you know, the first time I was there to sign books at, at Greyhound Reach the Beach was in, in, in October. So it had only been there yeah. for a month, roughly, when um, I was in Dewey and signing books. And at that point in time, I'm trying to remember, but I seem to think it was like still up at the top, uh, the top of the, um, the top floor of the Atlantic Ocean side or something. It was, you know, it was still pretty. Now, actually, by then it had gotten much larger than it was. Initially, the first time I went, it was maybe, I don't know, maybe 300 people. Uh, and by yeah. the early 2000s, you, it was in thou a thousand people or whatever and got even bigger. I think one year they yeah. were 300. I think one year they were up to 3,000. I suspect it sold like hotcakes that first oh, year. Oh, yes, it? it did. It, it sold very well. In fact, for the first couple of years, it sold really, really well. Then, you know, it kind of drifted down, but that's when the first, actually maybe more than a couple of years, maybe more three, or three to five years. But then, of course, that's when the track started to close and uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah. um, you know, the demand wasn't quite as great. And plus, of course, so many people bought it, there was hardly anyone that didn't have it. Uh, you know, the groups were selling it. Um, it was available on Amazon. Uh, it also was ended up, you know, they did a... Um, uh, a Kindle version. So, um, so, so it did, you know, it did very well. Um, I was pleased yeah, with how well yeah. it did and continues. I mean, I'm still twice a year getting a small little royalty check. So, uh, uh which by the way, if I had agreed to do the, the for higher book, my royalties would have stopped completely. So <laughs> I didn't see, I oh, didn't wow. see, you know, if, yeah, it may not be much, but yeah. at least I don't have to put in six months of work to get it. You know? <laughs> I mean, I already put in all that work. I don't need to do more of that. So um, anyway, 
but so it was it's all it's always amusing um uh, you, you don't get this question very much on Facebook groups anymore because I think there's so there's so many fewer first time yeah. greyhound adopters. Yeah. But but every now and then there'll be a question. I'm I'm a new adopter. I'm looking for a book. Uh, can anybody make recommendations? And and immediately the the Living Good Camp weighs in and the Brannigan <laughs> Camp weighs in. Um, and uh, it's always amusing to see, you know. I like Lee's book because thus and such. Well, I like Cynthia's book because thus and such. Yeah. So that's always, but they are different books. Oh, they're very different. Yeah, they're, uh, they're not the same. And so I, you know, I don't think there's any downside yeah. to having no. both of them. But, uh, uh, I have both. Of them. Um, it's always amusing to see people to weigh in, you know, like that. Now, let me ask you this: Did you get uh, as as the years, you know, after it initially sold and so forth? Did you get? Uh, did people try to contact you directly to ask a specific a question oh, yes. about? Yeah. Uh, an issue with their greyhound oh, and absolutely sort of uh still happens you know it still happens occasionally uh not as much as it did but then there aren't as many new gray new, new greyhound people out there um yeah somehow or another and you'd be surprised at the number of people who track me down in fact um one of my favorite stories is uh, i had i guess it was about eight o'clock in the morning it was before dummies was published um, I can't even remember if I had the contract and was working on it at that time. About 8 o'clock in the morning, I answered the phone, and there's this guy who, said, who identifies himself. You know, and says, <clears throat> this is Charlie Lloyd. I want your book. What's your address? I'm on my way to pick one up. And I'm like, whoa, slow down, honey. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> and uh, they had just adopted a dog who was a spook. They were told the dog was, quote, recoverably shy. She was a spook. And they were terrified of what was going to happen if she got loose. And I ended up working with them with the dog and ended up becoming best friends. Uh, sadly, uh, Jane died, you know, the wife died uh, it'll be a year ago in another couple of days. And Charlie died about a year before that. So they're both gone oh, now, but oh. they were just wonderful friends. We ended up going to Dewey together. Yeah. We ended up going to, um, I forget the name of the of the. A, a, um, the thing in, uh, in Myrtle Beach, I forget what that one's called, the Greyhound one. Um, but, you know, they were just, they turned into wonderful people and wonderful friends. And Charlie was always out there. I mean, he was just, <laughs> you know, we would be in a restaurant and he would be make, finding ways to tease the waitress or the, or the waiter. Um, you know, so lots of fun and something that, you know, we really miss. So, but you know how it is. You've got a friend for 20 years. It's, they leave a big, mark on your life so yeah absolutely do, do you still have people when you speak in an event of any sort do you still have people coming up and bringing it with them for oh, you yes. to sign? even uh i've been doing the last couple of years i've done greyhounds in gettysburg uh you know done presentations there and uh always there's somebody who would like me to sign their book i've even had people come sign up for my classes and bring their book along for me to sign so so there's still an interest in it, which is nice. I just wish it were more up to date than you know than it is, but I can't fix that. Yeah. What What are some of the things you would do to to bring it up to date? Oh my, um, well, I, the little bit that I talked about, I didn't talk a lot about the industry because it really wasn't all that relevant to what I would. But my focus on behavior issues would be completely different in many ways. Uh, you know, as I've evolved as a behavior specialist and a trainer, so has my thinking evolved about how best to do things and what kinds of things I see most most routinely. We talked about that earlier, about separation anxiety and, and some of the dog-dog reactivity. So I would be spending a lot more time updating those techniques to the things that I've found that I've been, I think I've improved over the years. Um, and that's that's what comes to mind first it's just the training behavior stuff uh more emphasis on helping people understand that bringing a new dog into your home is really quite the experience for the dog especially for a dog that's not been in a home um you know they've had a very structured life and going into a home can be just overwhelming for some dogs and i'm talking dogs generally not just greyhound i mean i i work with you know i end up like my reactive dog classes are often full of rescues um 
and their rescues, like the incoming one, like a couple of Chihuahua mixes and a couple of German Shepherds and a couple of whatever. Um, so, so some of the things are all the same. These dogs that come out of a an adoption situation um, have some similarities in terms of their needs and how they adjust. And I talk more. I think I talk more about the time frame that you, where you, they start to begin to understand new experiences, and that you know the first couple of weeks you have no idea who that dog is because they don't know who they are, and then the next uh, the next change will be around three four months. And then again around six months, and it's really a year sometimes until you know what dog you have. You know, it can take that long, and what you do with that time, uh, how you handle that dog in that period of time, has a lot to do with what dog you have at the end of the year. I mean, they're still, they're still clay. I mean, they're not, uh, there are a lot of things about them that are inherited that are part of their nature, part of their being, but there are also things that, are, that can still be modified for good or bad. And um, I think that trying to get people to understand how much patience you need with a new dog that comes into your home, uh, no matter where they've been. I mean, it doesn't matter whether they're coming off a track or whether they're coming from a home situation where, you know, one of the dogs that I, I just met with, the people, one of the people was looking to come into a class as the dog because the owner died and nobody in the family would take it. Uh, so, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, those are the things um, that I would change, you know, more about helping them acclimate. In fact, I did a little, like, I guess it's about four pages booklet that I offered to the various Greyhound groups about written sort of like from the dog's perspective. Here, here's, here's how the world looks to me. Um, here's why this works, why this doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, because I wanted to get that into a format that was short enough that it could be given to adopters um, easily. It wouldn't, co wouldn't cost anything at all to run off printer copy. Uh, you know, it didn't have to go to a printer. You know, could run it off on your computer on the printer. Um, so I've done that. Um, and I've done, you know, of course, all of the stuff I'm teaching, every one of those handouts is a hand. Is, is, you know, I do a lot of handouts. Virtually when I'm teaching, um, I tell them, I explain to them what the skill is. <clears throat> I show them how to do it. Um, I then help them do it, and then I send them home with a handout. So I try to cover all of the possible ways that people tend to learn. Uh, you know, so whether they're visual learners or they read or they hear or whatever. Uh, so I have lots of handouts that I've written, and I started writing those back in the early 2000s. But those are the things I changed. Those those handouts alone. I have a friend who keeps telling me that's you know, I've got enough handouts. I've got another book. Um, so, but so you know, somebody leaves my class, they basically got a, a mini version of uh, you know Greyhounds for Dummies because I'm constantly updating yeah, yeah. The, the information that's in it that way. You know, not being published, but my students and my clients are getting getting what it is I've learned and, how, and what's changed for me. If you had a publisher come to you and say, you know, on the strength of your dummies book, we'd like you to write another, uh, another book, not necessarily just Greyhound specific, but uh, about all breeds. You have another book in you, you think? I think so. I think I would. Um, you know, of course, they'd have to be coming to me with with an offer where it included royalties and not a, a work for hire. Even now, I, I, if yeah, you look yeah. at the dummies book, I'm not the copyright owner. They are. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's how right. they work. Yeah. So um, yeah. if I were to do it again, I would first of all talk to somebody who knew more about publishing than I did, uh, and yeah. try to get some yeah. good advice about how to handle those things. But I certainly <laughs> wouldn't do it for a work for hire. I mean, if this is my name yeah. going on it and this is my history, I'm not just going to spend six months writing it or whatever. Because literally, I would have had to take six months off away from what I, you know, my business and the classes that I do for the, my friend and, um, you know, not for the, not for a, a work for hire for something that would be, yeah. uh, that would have a royalty attached. Yeah, I do it. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, let's transition to another subject I've been wanting to ask you about. Uh, mm -hmm. and that is sort of the future of the American Greyhound community, uh, community of Greyhound owners here in the U S 
and, and that has to do with the uh, growing community of uh, hobby greyhound breeders uh, from who, who are breeding from racing bloodlines or coursing bloodlines, one of the two, or both. I'm one, yes, and that's well, why I it's remember. of particular interest I to remember. me. You remember you came, yes. our first letter back yes. in 2011, you happened to be in Georgia for another group's event, and we uh, prevailed on you to come and evaluate puppies. Uh, those yes. 10 puppies. And then if I remember and, right, I got to see them again when they were about a year old. You yeah. may have. I think you may have come down for something yeah. else, and, and we so I met made some sure of them, you got yeah. to see. Yeah, yeah. And you, your impression was, we. it was the funniest thing we... They lived up in the kennel, of course, mm -hmm. which was up the hill from our house. And we had our friend Lisa Strickland, who was going to get one of the puppies. She lugged them down one at a time. <laughs> they were like, I don't know, eight or ten weeks old at the time. And your impression was, as I recall, was that they were, in personality-wise, they were fairly homogenous. Yeah. You didn't see a lot of, yeah. you know, anything on one end of the spectrum or the other. I, I was, of course, yeah. very pleased about that. And I've noticed the same thing about most of our litters. We don't seem to have any particularly shy ones and, and, uh, or particularly aggressive ones or things like that. So I, I always remember that that was your, mm -hmm. your, um, yeah. your take yeah, on We on did it. temperament testing on all of them. I recall it was, <laughs> we're setting it up in like so, your living room. <laughs> that kind of leads me up to the question and let me set it up for you a little bit. Uh oh, so setting me as up. these, okay. as the, uh, I said, uh oh, he's setting me up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not. I'm setting the okay, question okay. about you. Uh, the as we this discussion happens all the time now on the social media greyhound groups. Uh, it particularly happened uh, in the lead up to the Florida tracks mm. of, uh, closing, and, and the 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 argument is always you won't be able to have a greyhound uh, like you've had that was raised in a in the breeding farm and in the racing environment. They're unique. There's no other greyhounds like them, et cetera. I used to believe that myself. And then I got my first greyhound puppy, and then we bred litters. And lo and behold, I found that there's not much difference, at least in my Not when they're adults. It, yeah. I, I've, exactly. I mean, we, exactly. most of us and haven't so, had a lot of experience with the puppy part of it. You have. But, uh, right, right. That's right. So I've always challenged people. I said, look, I'm, I'm telling you, I, you can – I've got former racers and I've got homebred, home reared uh, greyhounds. And anybody that wants to come to our place, I'll let you spend as much time as you want with them. And then if you can tell me which one was uh, racing mm -hmm. bred and, and raised on a, a breeding farm and which ones we raised here, I'll buy you the ste a steak dinner at Atlanta's most expensive steak restaurant. So against that backdrop, and I've become to believe that nurture uh, nature, which is to say their bloodlines, their DNA, is every bit as important as Absolutely. nurture in terms of the way they are reared. What's your take the on The same. That? I mean, I there are some things where, you know, there are certain traits that are highly heritable, and you can say yes if you, well, here's the best example. I get people all the time who they want me to fix the dog because it's barking, and it's a terrier. I mean, they were bred to do that. So if either of the parents is a barker, the odds that the puppies will be barkers. Um, you know, if people don't understand. They bred these dogs to go down in the ground, and they wanted them to bark. So if they get stuck or lost, they know where to find them and how to rescue them. So if you start breeding those dogs and putting them in homes, they're going to be terriers, just like greyhounds are going to be greyhounds. If they're going to see a rabbit, and they're going to want to chase it, or they're going to see a deer, and away they go. Um, you know, you can't fight that part of it. However, um, you can with dogs like that, if you started when they were a puppy, to work with them on the barking issue, you can subdue some of that. For instance, uh, I, my, the two dogs I have right now are both barkers. I've not had any greyhounds up to now that are barkers. Both of these guys are. One particularly, so he thinks he needs to announce everything in the neighborhood. But I've learned with him, well, I should say he learned, that if I catch him before he gets full blast, uh, all I need to do is go, you see, quiet, quiet. And he's learned that, oh, that means I'm not, and he does, you know, and it's not like he's being punished for it or anything else. He just simply has learned that that's what I like. And so, okay, we'll do it that way. Now, on the other hand, if there's a certain fire truck in the neighborhood, all bets are off. He's, he howls his head off. 
Um, but yeah, you know, so, so a dog, so my guess is that probably in his case, there were other dogs in his litter that barked. Um, but by and large, you know, there are some traits that tend to pass along, but an awful lot of them have to do with what happens to that puppy in the first 12 weeks of its life. And then what happens over the next few months when they get into adolescence. And then that second fear period is the, is when they're seven or eight months old. All of that stuff has probably every, I shouldn't say probably, I think it has every bit as much to do with the dog's final personality when they're an adult as what their, what their genes said. Um, so you can modify the genes and the genes can modify the behavior, but you still have to have both in, you still have both in the mix, no matter what you say or what you do. And I, yeah. I'm a, you know, I have not had a lot of experience working with uh, greyhounds that were not um, kennel dog, you know, MGA dogs. Uh, I've only seen, met a few of them, and it's when I was going with a friend, she was very, 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 very much into lure coursing, and uh, there I did see some some AKC greyhounds, and um, they they seem to be very different. But that's a different issue altogether. You know, they've been bred not for lure coursing or for work. They've been bred to look good in the, in the rain, and some of them also can work. So, you know, just a different approach to what you want from the dog. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I think you'll probably begin to see more uh, homebred, home-reared, and again, bred from racing lines, not show lines, uh, as you as you have more classes and so forth. It'll be interesting to get your take on on those, and I would suggest when you, if you do get puppies, you know, ask a little bit about their pedigree. What, what are they racing bred, or you know, what are their? I lines? actually have. I, a, I suspect that's going to make a difference. I have a, a former student uh, who does, who did get a racing puppy. He drove, he flew to Texas and brought, or drove to Texas and brought it back. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't the, the instructor in the class that he took with with the dog as a puppy. So it just didn't fit, you know, I wasn't on the schedule when he needed to do it. But I have met it, and, you know, I met him, you know, as I was going in to do things. Delightful puppy, but I haven't seen her since, um, you know, I haven't seen her in several months. So she's an adult now, but she was basically like any other puppy her age. But she did come definitely from racing stock. I've been told, you know, we have, locally the group has, a, it's called the Greyhound Stride. It's like the first Sunday of each month, they all meet down on City Island, which is a kind of park area in the middle of the river, and they just walk their greyhounds. Uh, but it's always, fun. the Sundays are always the day that I also do classes, so I, I never see these dogs. But I've been told the dog's just an absolute delight, you know, because it's been raised properly, and, you know, it, and doesn't, nobody seems to know, I don't think anybody would know whether it came from a kennel or whether it came from from Ireland or, you know, from a puppy, a puppy, you know, a greyhound um, hobby breeder or whatever. It's just basically a, yeah. a, a greyhound, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I think that obviously I always say there's more than one way to skin yeah. a cat and there's more than one way to raise a, a, a nice yeah. companionable greyhound. Certainly breeding farms from the racing breeders are one way to do it, but I've, I've come to believe that uh, you know, properly reared hobby bred greyhounds. And if they are put in a home that, yeah. you know, can take them in hand and, and, and show them the way instead of letting them run amok, uh, you know, can do, can become great pets as well. Oh, I, I don't disagree with that at all. I, I, well, I, I feel very much that how, how the puppy is raised has everything, is everything a bit as much to do with their, the outcome is what their breeding background is. Um, and so, you know, i I can't see any difference in the ones I've met because I've met a number. I have didn't meet them as puppies, but I met them. Well, in fact, our girl, our you know, um, our twelve-year-old, she was a six-month-old puppy when I got her. So you know that she was she came off the farm at three months old because she had broken she had a broken leg, so she was never going to run. Yeah. Um, so you know she no I'm sorry she was four months old when she came off the farm, and so we've had her since she was six months old. And I can tell you, nobody would know whether she was an NGA raised in a kennel environment like an NGA dog would be, or raised in a home like she was. You know? so, yeah, yeah. 
uh, kind of along those lines, I had something else I wanted to ask you about. I've, I've read before that there, there's one theory that there's a period of a pup in a puppy's life, not particularly greyhound, but just any puppy, uh, where they, they, and I think the age range is like eight weeks to 10 or 11 weeks where it's called their, their fear period, or they're more likely to be fearful of noises or, uh, changes. And, and, and so for that reason, during that period of time, uh, they shouldn't, for example, be flown to their new home, uh, that they're going to, they sh you should either wait after you should wait until after that. What's, what's the latest thinking on that? I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I don't really deal with me the woman that I do classes for is a breeder. Her puppies don't get shipped out of the area. So I don't have any basis for, for commenting on that. My own feeling would be, um, my brothers would be like the guy that I mentioned, drove to Texas and brought the dog home. You know, he, so the dog was not put in the hold of a plane or any of those kinds of things. He yeah. drove there to get it and drove back, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. But yeah, there, there is that period from eight, about eight to, to 12 weeks where they do what they experience then needs to be all positive. It needs to be as good as it can be. And, um, yeah. so that's part of it. But then they, oh, there's also another fear period that they can go through when they're, you know, like six, seven, eight, eight months old, depending upon the dog and the breed. But so you have to be very careful during that period of time as well. Um, but a lot of that doesn't ha isn't an issue if you took the time to do the social socialization from from the beginning. Like for instance, my friend, um, she has a litter right now, and she's had people in from the time those puppies were a week old handling them. Anybody who wants to come pet puppies or hug puppies is welcome to come. She not only welcomes it, she does everything she can to make sure it happens. She takes those puppies yeah. as soon as they're, it's, as soon, their eyes are open and their ears are open and they're you know, like four weeks old or roughly, she's taking them places. You know, she's bringing them to the, to the, tent, the training center and stuff like that. Uh, well, I, no, they're not the training center that young because they, they haven't had their vaccines yet. But she's taking them any place where it's safe to take a puppy that young. Uh, like she'll take one to church with her. You know, um, and then when they get older, where they've had their shots and things, she'll start bringing them to the training center where they're meeting lots of people and they're meeting dogs that she thinks are appropriate. Uh, she breeds Labrador Retrievers and uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. So, uh, and she's been breeding Labradors for as long as I've known her, which is about 20, about 20 years, close to 20 years. So. Yeah, the the uh, one of the things I've enjoyed about the breeding process the most is just learning about some of this puppy psychology. I'm I've become an adherent to the. Uh, you're probably familiar with this early neurological stimulation. Yeah, uh, we do that with all of ours between three and sixteen, and it's an easy thing to do, and it's supposed to have great results. I can't swear by it either way, but it it certainly doesn't hurt, and it, it probably helps. There are. Um a lot of new books and, and new thinking coming out about uh, puppies and, and raising them and what's important to them and uh, and some stuff about how their sense of smell and how it's almost like a third a whole different kind of a whole different kind of thing than we always imagined it to be it's more than just smelling stuff and so there's a lot of new literature coming out in the last year or so that I've got books backed up to try to read which is you know I'm Aside from going to my, uh, down to take a look at a new computer next week, I'm also taking a few days off and just catch up on reading because I don't always have time to do that. And I feel even though I no longer have the certification and I'm no longer doing private sessions, I still need to keep up with what's happening in, in my field. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. And well, along those lines, I was going to ask you, what is there, what's, what's the future look like in terms of, are there, are there some now, uh, new theories, competing theories, where two schools of thought are uh, are growing about any particular aspect of canine behavior? Uh, well, you know, I think dog trainers are much like lawyers. You put three dog trainers in a room and you'll get six opinions. Um, so I think, <laughs> uh, I think that it's kind of like you, know, you can't get, for instance, Betsy and I agree in philosophy on training, but our styles of doing it are very different. 
you know, the way I will teach a per particular skill or the way or the advice I might give might be very different than hers. Nothing wrong with what she's doing, nothing wrong with what I'm doing, but one of them fits me better and one of them fits her better and, and we choose which ones are most likely to fit the student or the client best. You know, sometimes she's the better choice for that particular student. Sometimes I'm the better choice for that particular student. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's always conflict. There always will be, um, you know, there are the people who still feel that all this positive reinforcement stuff is just mumbo jumbo, that you can't train a dog using purely positive. Well, I guess it sort of depends on how you define positive. Um, but, you know, simple, I guess the philosophy that I'm kind of working from now is I borrowed, I'm borrowing this from uh, Trish McConnell. Uh, where she talks about patient and polite. And I'm basically telling folks, you know, if you'd expect your, your, your three-year-old kid to say please, there's no reason why your dog shouldn't be saying please. And that what that means is sit down or, you know, sit or, or just stand and what, whatever, but pay attention to me and wait for permission. Wait for permission to go out the door. Wait for permission to get your food. So all you need to do is say please, which is sit and look at me, and then you can have lots of things you want. Um, and that goes a long way. Uh, people are amazed when I show them how quickly you can teach a dog not to charge at their food dish. I can teach it to most dogs within three minutes. Because I can remember you oh, doing that fun. on stage. Yeah, so yeah. it's basically, you know, all I have to do is that, that they figure out that their behavior is costing them what they want. And, you know, it takes no time at all. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's what we do. And so, you know, so I, I'm big on her approach to patient and polite. And I'm also, I really stress that if you, we've reached the point where dogs are more and more a part of the family than they've ever been before. And, uh, and when I first started training, 13 years old, so it was a long time ago. And the, the thinking then was the book I got from the library was you trained for 45 minutes, you trained the same time every day, you same strength, the same place every day. And I tell my students that, you know, what you get from that is a dog that behaves for 45 minutes in the kitchen at five o'clock. You know, they, you need to expose the dogs to lots and lots and lots of different places and things. So they learn to generalize that sit means sit, whether you're in the park or in the living room. Um, and that, you know, training isn't something you do to your dog, it's something you do with your dog. And you, you don't call it training. Think of it as raising your dog because you don't say, oh my gosh, it's three o'clock, I gotta train my kid. Basically, you're interacting with the dogs every minute of every day. It's a question of what's being trained, who's being trained, whether and what you think is being trained versus what the dog thinks. Uh, so, you know, I, I try to incorporate the stuff we're doing in a class situation into real life so that they learn that, oh, I can teach the dog to do this and it will prevent this problem or it will fix this yeah. situation. And it, I think it works out. So. Well, as we uh, as we wind up our conversation here, do you have any uh, upcoming uh, events at which you'll be speaking that you'd like to tell us uh, about? Actually, no. Uh, you know, I'm pretty much down to I'm only speaking at, you know, at Greyhounds in Gettysburg, and that's not until the spring. And I assume they'll ask me to come back. They seem to like it, but I I haven't you know gotten anything definite on that yet. Um, so, you know, it's really dwindled down because, the, like I said, there aren't any gro groups nearby anymore. Well, there are, there's one, yeah. there, there, there are some people working in this area that are part of a group that's in state college, but there isn't a specific local group. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's changed a lot. And so I'm not speaking as much as I did. I enjoy doing it. I have a great time doing it because, you know, that, I meet lots yeah. of incredible people. Uh, and get to hear incredible stories about Greyhound. So, well, we hope you'll you'll, you'll keep well, doing it, and uh, maybe we need to have you back down to Atlanta. Oh, I'd love it any time. So, <laughs> so. well, it's been a, it's been a great conversation, Lee. Certainly appreciate your uh, your sharing your wisdom and your experience with us, and uh, we hope you come back again sometime. Well, thanks for asking me. Thank you. Good evening. And Greyhound lovers, we'll see you again on the Greyhound Nation. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you are not a regular listener, be sure to follow Greyhound Nation wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
Just search for Grey Nation Show, follow us, and you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. You can also get new show notifications when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you like this episode, leave us a review on our Facebook page or your favorite podcast app. You can also send us feedback or questions via the contact form on our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. This episode was produced in collaboration with host John Parker. Our theme music was composed and performed by Dimitri Taras. Thanks to Lee Livinggood for joining us for today's episode. If you don't have a copy of Lee's book at home, Retired Racing Greyhounds for Dummies, you can get a copy in paperback or Kindle format at Amazon.com. Look for the link in our show notes. Lee continues to work with reactive dogs at Redfern Canines in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. If you live in the area, you can learn more about the training center at redfernpanines.com. I'm Michael Burns, and you've been listening to Greyhound Nation. <laughs>